These are the words of Gaius Julius Caesar. The German way of life is quite different from that of the Gauls. They have no druids to lead them in matters of religion, and they do not take much trouble about sacrifices. The only gods they recognize are visible objects with obviously beneficial effects, such as the sun, the moon, and fire. They have not even heard of any other gods. Their whole life is spent in hunting or in military pursuits, and from their earliest years, they train themselves to endure toil and hardship. Those who retain their chastity longest are most highly honored among their fellows because the Germans believe that continence makes a man grow taller and stronger and increases his muscular development. It is considered absolutely disgraceful in anyone under 20 to have had intercourse with a woman. Nevertheless, there is no secrecy about the facts of sex. Men and women bathe together in the rivers and they wear nothing except skins or short coats of reindeer hide, which leave most of the body bare. They do not go in much for agriculture, but live mostly on milk, cheese and meat. No one possesses any definite portion of land which he can call his own property. Each year, the magistrates and chiefs of the tribe allot a piece of land, using their own judgment as to its size and position, to clans or groups of kinsmen living together. And the following year, they make the tenants move on to another holding. They give a number of reasons for this custom of theirs. For example, to prevent people from getting so attached to a particular spot that they will lose their enthusiasm for war and take up agriculture instead. To check any desire for large estates, which would result in the strong driving the weak off their land. To discourage the building of houses, specially designed to protect the inmates from heat or cold. To prevent people from becoming fond of money, a vice which tends to lead to division and party strife. And to keep the common people happy and contented by letting each man see that he himself is just as well off as the most powerful people in the tribe. What makes a German tribe particularly proud of itself is to live in the middle of a wilderness with as much land as possible beyond its frontiers, waste and derelict. They think it is the real mark of being a great and powerful nation to be able to force their neighbors off their land so that no one dares settle near them. And at the same time, they regard themselves as being more secure this way, since there will be no risk of any sudden invasion. Whenever a tribe is involved in any war, offensive or defensive, Supreme commanders are chosen and are given the power of life and death over their fellow tribesmen. In peacetime, there are no magistrates with general powers. The chiefs of various districts and the leaders of clans administer justice and settle disputes among their own people. There is no disgrace in committing acts of brigandage, so long as these are done outside the frontiers of the tribe. Indeed, this is regarded as good training for the young men, and something which will prevent them from getting lazy. When one of their chiefs gets up in an assembly to say he will lead a raiding party and asks for volunteers to come with him, those who like the idea and approve of the leader rise to their feet and, amid general applause, promise him their help. If any of these fail to follow him in the end, they are regarded as traitors and deserters and will never be trusted again in anything. They think it wrong to commit any violence against a guest. Anyone who comes to a house of theirs for whatever reason is safe from injury and treated as sacrosanct. He can go to any man's home he likes and will receive his share of food there. The Suebi are much the largest and most warlike of all the German nations. They are said to consist of a hundred clans, from each of which they draw every year a thousand men to be used as warriors fighting outside their frontiers. 
The rest, who stay at home, support both the army and themselves, and in the following year, take their turn at military service while the others stay at home. In this way, their lands are cultivated without interruption, and they are also continually trained and practiced in war. They have no private ownership of land, and it is their rule not to settle down and stay in any one place for more than a year. They allow traders into their country, but this is rather because they want to find purchases for their booty than because they are particularly anxious to import anything from abroad. It is interesting to note that while the Gauls are extremely fond of horses and will pay huge prices for them, the Germans use no imported horses at all. Instead, they stick to their own breed of the animal small, ugly creatures, and by giving them regular training, make them remarkably tough and efficient. In cavalry engagements, they often jump from their horses and fight on foot, the horses being trained to stand still, meanwhile, so that the warrior can remount quickly if need be. According to their way of thought, the use of a saddle is thoroughly disgraceful and effeminate. Consequently, however few they may be, they will confidently attack any body of saddled horsemen, however large. They allow no wine to be imported because they think that wine makes men soft and effeminate and incapable of enduring hardship. They think that the greatest glory a nation can have is to keep as broad a belt as possible of uninhabited land across their frontiers since this, in their view, is an indication that great numbers of other states are unable to stand up to them in war. So, for example, it is said that on one side of the Suebic territory, one will find nearly 600 miles of country which is uninhabited. On another side, their nearest neighbors are the Ubii, who were once by German standards a large and prosperous nation. There was a time in the past when the Gauls were a more warlike race than the Germans. They actually invaded Germany and settled colonies beyond the Rhine because their own population was too large for the land available to them. In this way, the Balki Tectusades seized and occupied the most fertile district of Germany. This is the part near the Hercynian Forest, which I see Eratosthenes and other Greeks had heard about and called the Orcanian Forest. The Hercynian Forest, which has just been mentioned, extends so far that a man traveling light would take nine days to cross it. This is the only way they have of describing it, since the Germans have no words for the measurements of distances. The forest begins on the frontiers of the Elveti, the Nemetes, and the Rauraki and runs right along the bank of the Danube to the country of the Daki and the Anatis. At this point, it turns away from the river in a northeasterly direction. As it is of such an enormous extent, it touches the countries of a number of different peoples. Indeed, one cannot find anyone in that part of Germany which we know who would claim to have reached the eastern end of this forest even after traveling for 60 days in that direction. Nor has anyone learned where it begins. <laughs>